Are you looking for completely underqualified advice on what it takes to become an astronaut? Well, look no further. Hi, my name is Victoria Brazil, and I'm a graduate student at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University getting my master's degree in human factors aerospace engineering. For the next like 10 or 20 minutes or something, I'm going to be telling you about a physiological performance assessment or a PPA made to test if you've got what it takes to be an astronaut. There are existing PPAs for astronauts, but today we're going to talk about my own personal structure known as the Brazilian Astronautics PPA. Let's go. The first thing we need to talk about is homeostasis, which is the various processes of maintaining a stable internal environment in our bodies. Homeostasis allows us to balance various environments and activities all while maintaining a stable internal environment. For example, if I start to run right now, I'm generating a lot of heat through various processes of muscle contraction, not to mention the heat that I'm getting from my environment today. After a little while, my internal temperature is going to start increasing, and I have various homeostatic functions in place to keep me cool. I'm starting to sweat, which cools off my body by convective cooling, and the capillaries near the surf surface of my skin are starting to dilate which allows more blood to flow to the surface of my skin and be able to off-put heat into my environment. This is a very simple example of a homeostatic function called thermal regulation. All these homeostatic processes keep me at a stable internal environment in my body to keep me healthy. Maintaining a stable internal environment is a crucial part of our evolution and enables us to perform well. The harsher the environment and the more complex the activity, the harder it is for us to maintain homeostasis. There's no question that astronauts are brave, intelligent, and most likely the best of us. That's what makes this industry so interesting in regards to human factors. A lot of medical disciplines focus on making unhealthy people healthy again. For astronauts, we take some of the fittest and healthiest people, put them in extremely dangerous environments, and try to keep them healthy. This means that only the toughest and the healthiest people are fit to be astronauts. Because space introduces a whole slew of problems for human health. There are some dangers of space travel that fall outside the scope of this discussion as it pertains to a PPA of astronaut candidates. Those dangers include things like radiation from galactic cosmic rays. Here on Earth, our atmosphere filters out a significant portion of harmful radiation from space, but enough comes through that we still need to wear sunscreen to protect our skin. Radiation in space can't be controlled for at an individual's level, and mitigation lies at the system level of the spacecraft via shielding or magnetic fields. The first topic as it relates to space physiology that we're going to discuss is one that I think will hit very close to home for a lot of folks. Spaceflight introduces the stressor of social isolation. Sound familiar? Yeah, I'll get back to that. Astronauts experience a very extreme level of social isolation, being isolated from friends, family, and coworkers, other than the few that are with them on board for months at a time. Within our current exploration capabilities, our astronauts are able to communicate relatively quickly with ground stations and their loved ones. Uh, you're coming out about. However, as we venture back to the moon and eventually on to Mars, our communication lines become more disparate, making social isolation even more severe. I think we're all extremely familiar with the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember those first few months where we had to stay home and isolate from others? You may have cleaned out your garage, binge watch movies and shows you'd promise you'd never watch or never watch again, or picked up a new hobby to do at home. Or you just watched a lot of TV. All to stay home and socially distance. Most, if not all of us, learned what it was like to feel isolated and confined. It was tough. The silver lining here is that COVID-19 provided the largest scale social isolation experiment probably ever. So not only did NASA astronauts provide the general population with insight on how to cope with isolation, 
but we all collectively provided the largest analog study of the long-term effects of isolation and confinement. So how is this incorporated into the Brazilian PPA? Well, we study an astronaut candidate's ability to cope with isolation and confinement through analog studies here on Earth. Each candidate must be assigned to a small team of three to six people and confined in an analog space station. You can read up on such analogs like the Mars 500 and high seas experiments. Here, candidates are locked in space station analogs and exposed to space analogous environments, freeze-dried food, recycled water, communication delays, only leaving the station and spacesuits for short periods of time, and more. The stressors of isolation and confinement will quickly become apparent. The PPA will focus on studying the ability for a candidate to cope with these stressors, and if they struggle, how well they can adapt to new mitigation strategies and countermeasures, like journaling, meditation, and more. The targeted data will be an individual's resiliency to social isolation and confinement stressors and their ability to be a successful team player and carry out a mock mission under such stressors. Another physiological change in space is circadian disruptions. The relative day-night cycle on the ISS currently is about every 90 minutes due to the orbital rotation around the Earth. Astronauts experience disruptions to their circadian rhythm due to these light changes and other various factors aboard space stations like vibration, workload, and more. The Brazilian PPA can assess a candidate's fitness for this stressor by administering a sleep deprivation study. This part of the PPA will deprive astronaut candidates of sleep while monitoring their ability to continue working on completing a given mission. The candidates who are able to handle sleep deprivation the best will be scored the highest. <laughs> Before Sir Isaac Newton published his theory of gravity in 1687, humans just floated around on the Earth. Just kidding. Humans have always been under the influence of gravity on Earth. Our bodies are designed and equipped to handle the influence of Earth's gravitational pull. If our bodies didn't compensate for gravity, all our blood would pool at our feet while standing. You've actually probably noticed this if you stood up too fast after lying down for a while. Your heart and blood vessels haven't had time to react to the rapid change in your positioning, allowing gravity to pull a significant amount of blood down below your head and heart, which likely resulted in feeling lightheaded or even fainting. Thankfully, our circulatory system is equipped to counter this gravitational pull. The power of our hearts, along with smooth and skeletal muscle in our lower bodies, push blood upwards, allowing for a regulatory blood flow system that defies gravity. Things get real weird when humans go into space. Those smooth and skeletal muscles that were once defying gravity to push blood upwards in, from our lower body into our upper body now have no opposition. This results in a massive fluid shift to the upper body, similar to what I might experience if I stay in this handstand for too long. One thing we have to prepare for regarding this fluid shift is the strength of our heart. Without gravity, our heart has to work less to keep blood circulating in the body. This means that after a while, our heart muscle atrophies if not properly prevented. This isn't a huge deal while we're in space because we adapt to it, but becomes problematic when we come back to Earth's gravity or other gravitational fields on the moon or Mars. We need strong hearts to pump blood efficiently to our body systems upon landing. This is extremely important when we venture away from the Earth, as we won't have access to ground crew to assist us upon landing like we do here on Earth. How is this incorporated into the PPA for astronaut selection? Well, the stronger your heart is before entering microgravity, the less dangerous cardiac muscle atrophy will be upon landing. We can strengthen our hearts via aerobic exercise, like running or cycling. Exercise will be of paramount importance while in space to maintain this strength, but for the purposes of the PPA, we will be most concerned with prevention and identifying the heart's best fit to fly. The Brazilian PPA will assess heart strength by VO2 max test on a cycle ergometer and analysis of resting heart rate. The candidates with the strongest hearts will stand out from this assessment. The same theme applies to two other important physiological changes in microgravity skeletal muscle atrophy, and bone loss. We experience weightlessness in microgravity, which means we don't have to use our muscles to keep us upright and we aren't weight bearing on our bones. We use a lot of muscles to stay upright in relation to gravity, including our back, our core, and our legs. Without gravity, we don't use these muscles as much 
and they begin to atrophy unless specifically targeted during exercise in flight. However, even with targeted exercise in flight, astronauts can still experience significant skeletal muscle atrophy in space. Just as with the heart, it's really important for us to have strong muscles upon re-entry to gravity, especially on the moon or Mars, when we don't have access to a ground crew support. What we need to avoid is landing on Mars, exiting our spacecraft, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for and then immediately collapsing. Just like with cardiac muscle, prevention is paramount with skeletal muscles, meaning the strength of these muscles pre-flight will lessen the severity of any atrophy experienced in space. The PPA will assess each candidate's skeletal muscle strength and those with sufficient strength will be in good standing. This will be analyzed through traditional strength training assessments to ensure our candidates are in good physical standing. For the same reason skeletal muscle atrophies in space, our bones also lose density due to lack of weight bearing. Again, this can be mitigated to an extent by in-flight exercise, but pre-flight strength is still vital. The PPA will analyze bone density via traditional bone densitometry methods. Those currently experiencing or severely predisposed to osteoporosis might not be a good fit. In my opinion, one of the coolest physiological changes that happens in space is the onset of space-induced motion sickness. In our inner ear, we have what's called a vestibular system. This set of small organs provides us with sensory information about our orientation, both linear and angular movement. Since this system relies on input from our orientation relative to gravity, our proprioception gets a little messed up when we leave Earth and enter microgravity. This results in motion sickness for the first few days in space until we adapt. Re-entry to gravitational fields results in another onset of disorientation due to the reintroduction of spatial cues from gravity. This can be dangerous if astronauts need to emergency egress, egress their spacecraft upon landing, but they're experiencing disorientation and motion sickness, which can be very bad. So how is this incorporated in the Brazilian PPA? Well, we test a candidate's initial visceral reactions to motion sickness to establish a baseline, and we can then implement a motion sickness exposure plan to lessen the severity of these reactions in the future. Lastly, my PPA will ensure that none of my candidates have claustrophobia, because space stations are pretty confining. So, do you think you have what it takes to pass the Brazilian Astronautics Physiological Performance Assessment?